Before we get started with today's show, I wanted to tell you about another great ESPN podcast, Brian Winhurst and the Hoop Collective. They post episodes on Monday and Thursday mornings bright and early. The latest one discusses which players have decided against playing in the NBA's return and the chances of those who do wearing health tracking technology. Be sure to check it out. You can download and subscribe to Brian Winhurst and the Hoop Collective now as well as the right time wherever you get your podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. Uh, coming up on this episode of The Right Time, what in the world is your man Dak Prescott doing? Are these boys going to actually play college football? We also got your stories about the time you thought you were going to have a big party with a million people, but ain't nobody really show up. But first... Oh boy, NASCAR made its way into our news. Gabe, I tell you something funny. I wound up in a back and forth with some dude yesterday on the tweets. And I was talking about the thing with NASCAR. And for those of you who don't know, I think this is an important thing to put into this Bubba Wallace story because there's a lot being made about the fact that a noose was left in his garage area. And obviously a lot should be made about that fact. But what was going on outside the stadium was just as important, or the track rather, is just as important to me as the thing that happened with him with the noose. In fact, now, let me let me be careful on that, because I do think that with the noose, the thing that's important about the noose that they kind of wave it over a little bit as they showed everybody walking with Bubba Wallace on the track is there's a good chance that whoever was out there with him on that track, one of those people is the one that put that noose in there. Right. Like from what they've told us about who had access to this area, it is entirely possible that somebody that's out there claiming that they was down for him on the NASCAR kick actually is one of the people that did this. Right. This might have happened. This might be a thing. And so that's a concern that I think that NASCAR has, obviously, is which one of your people apparently did this. But The Guardian did a story about this. And I didn't really see this in too many places. But The Guardian, for what is worth, um, a British publication had this. There were people who were driving around in Talladega with their flags up, right? Like that was their big thing. They wanted to show that they were still around. And so they riding around with their Confederate flags. And then you had, which I think has been more publicized, a plane that flew over Talladega with a banner with a Confederate flag that said defund NASCAR, right? Like these are the things that are going on right now. And the way that I put it is NASCAR is saying, hey, we're not a racist entity. We're not a racist sport. And the racists are like, says who? Like, uh, uh, what, do, what, do, what do you mean you're not? I, I, I thought we had an understanding um, about this one. So I had some cat pop up, and he was just on the, you know, you know, but don't never talk about NASCAR. I don't trust his, you know, or know any NASCAR fans. No, I know NASCAR fans, right? Like, it's not every friend that I've ever had, but, like, I know NASCAR fans. And so one thing I talked to a good friend of mine who's really into NASCAR, and a point that he made, and I think the Talladega pointed this out, Cause I told him, I was like, look, I've been to a race down at Homestead, uh, which is south of Miami. I was like, I didn't really see the flag and all that stuff out there. He's like, yeah, the newer tracks, you're not really going to see it there. He's like, you're not going to see it. Um, I think Chicago was an example he gave, but he was like, the new tracks, you're not really going to see it. He's like, but when you start getting into like the traditional tracks, right? When you start getting to Talladega, to Martinsville, um, to Darlington, right? When you started going to those tracks, he's like, that's when it's going to be an issue. Cause it's the flag, it's the t-shirts. It's everything else. Like, it's going to take a lot for them to get those folks to stop doing this. They're going to throw a lot of people out if they're really dedicated to making this thing happen. And I had somebody hit me on the, oh, man, you know, you only want to talk about this because it's a matter of race. And it's like, it's not that I only want to talk about this as a matter of race, but we all have to acknowledge, objectively speaking, right, if you can separate yourself from the pain that's associated with this, this is the most intellectually interesting thing that's happened around NASCAR in quite a while. You know, like otherwise, I don't know what else you want me to come out here and talk about with regards to NASCAR, whether I'm a fan or not, that other people want to get to. Hey, man, this is a national story right now. And we're here because NASCAR's got one black driver in the midst of America pretending to have some sort of awakening. And they got to figure out what to do, because a lot of the stuff they've been doing only works if there's no black people around. Well, now you got a black person around. Hey, maybe we need to rethink this whole uh, Confederate flag thing. Right. OK, because Bubba Wallace is here. And I watched what went on at Talladega on Monday. 
Let me give you one thing to note about Talladega that I did not realize, honestly, until this morning before preparing to do this podcast. I saw this on TV after I'd seen what I'm going to tell you, but uh, Paul Fiveball mentioned that the press box at Talladega used to be named after George Wallace, right? We got to take this another step further. That track at Talladega was built in a large part because Bill France, the patriarch of NASCAR, endorsed George Wallace for president in 1972. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, that's the thing. That's how that whole track got to be there in the first place. That is a track in large part that segregation built. Now, of course, this comes after the segregation and everything else. But when you, when the owner of the whole damn thing decides he's going to put his arm around George Wallace for president, you're given a signal about what kind of party it is that you're throwing because what we know George Wallace for segregation now segregation tomorrow segregation forever and that's who the man that ran nascar put his arm around in part to build this track that we're talking about right now this track that's at the centerpiece of everything you got to understand this if you're going to talk about what all of this means for nascar right the relationship that they have with people who do things like wave the confederate flag They have embraced those people. And when the time came that it wasn't really justifiable to do that, they told those people to stop bringing their flags, but then didn't do anything about it when they actually brought their flags. To put this in context, Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi, did more to get people to stop waving Confederate flags than NASCAR did. The school whose mascot is the Rebels did more to stop people from waving the flag at their stadium than NASCAR did to get people to stop waving the flag at their tracks, right? This is what they've built. And now they got to figure out how to take it down. They had decades to do this. It didn't have to be this. But somewhere along the way, they decided that this was going to be their branding, right? They decided their branding was going to be a branding of the South, but a very particular kind of South Because I'm talking about a South that doesn't have black people and a South that works hard to keep black people away. Like the thing I feel like the people who are not from the South don't really understand is how many black people are in the South, right? The numbers have declined over the years because of the great migration. But take a state like South Carolina, for example. South Carolina was majority black until 1930. Per the census. Go look that up. It was majority black per the census. Mississippi was in a very similar place there. You look at it now. Last time I checked, Mississippi was something like 36% black. Alabama, some somewhere between 20 and 30% black. Georgia, 30% black. Texas, 20% black. Florida, I want to say is something like 20% black. South Carolina, even though South Carolina was so miserable that it used to be like 50% black, it's now like 25 or something like that because we was getting the hell out of there but it's still 25% black. Like this is a significant part of the population that NASCAR and a lot of folks like NASCAR have just totally chosen to ignore. I don't know if you saw this, Gabe, but Rolling Stone sent something out. And this is from a few years ago where Tom Petty, before he died, was talking about the Confederate flag because Tom Petty in 85 put out an album called Southern Accents and the branding was very skittered, right? Very, very Leonard Skinner, very Confederate flag all over the place. And he said that he'd come back and realize what a mistake that was. But it was interesting in his first person story talking about it. Petty kept talking about, well, it was just something that we did in the South. It was, you know, it was up at the courthouse. It was all these places that I die. And it's this vision of the South that infuriates me more than anything else because it's a vision of the South without black people. Like when white people want to think about what the South is that are local, they typically do it while ignoring us completely. But think about what Petty's saying. Petty's saying that his flag was up at the courthouse. Like this is just an everyday, normal part of life. And that is what NASCAR decided they were going to wrap themselves up in. And it's not like it's something they just did back in the day. As the symbols change, the activities remain the same. Think about this. In 2016, Brian France, Bill France's son, who was running NASCAR at the time, NASCAR endorsed Donald Trump for president. They had four drivers come out there to endorse Donald Trump for president. I don't care what you think about Donald Trump right now, right? Because it's really difficult to talk about him because politics, you know, and all of that stuff, right? 
However, the way that I'm talking about George Wallace right now, I can say these things about George Wallace with no reservation. Nobody minds. George Wallace good and dead, right? Nobody cares about that. The way that I'm talking about Bill France endorsing George Wallace in 50 years is going to be the way that people talk about Brian France endorsing Donald Trump. They are very, very similar figures. In fact, you can go back and look at the states and places that voted and that George Wallace got the nomination. Go look at how that matches up with a lot of where Trump got things done in that 2016 election, right? They're very, very similar historical figures when you think about it, except Trump obviously has been more successful in his attempts at winning things nationally. NASCAR decided that they were going to be the ones to do that. No matter what you think about Donald Trump, I'm here to tell you, black folks see you put your arm around Donald Trump in that way. It's an antagonistic decision for you to make. It is. And in fact, for NASCAR, when they embraced Ronald Reagan in the ways that they did, that was an antagonistic action toward black people. Ronald, I believe, in state rights in Philadelphia, Mississippi in 1980. That's how we see this. And so now we got Bubba Wallace, who drives for Richard Petty's race team. And by the way, when Richard Petty won his 200th race, which was a very big deal, who was on hand for it? Ronald Reagan. Who was so excited that Ronald Reagan showed up? Richard Petty. Okay, so these are all the historical things that come together in this moment where all of this has happened for, to Bubba Wallace. Now, I want to talk about what happened to Wallace less in a macro sense than in a micro sense that I think my life experience has informed to a degree and is partially informed by the time that Bubba Wallace came on our podcast, right? And this was, gave us about a year ago that we had him on, give or take. I think it was in August. Yeah, somewhere in there. And so I wanted to have Wallace on, and I talked about it for a while of wanting to have him on. NASCAR brought him to the National Association of Black Journalists Convention in Philadelphia in 2011, and I was really impressed by him, and I saw a star. Like, I looked up and I saw a star. I didn't realize how young he was at the time, but I know a star when I see one, and there was one right in front of me. And I wanted to see how it went, and I said, since that day, I was like, if that boy can drive even a little bit, just a little bit, he's going to be a giant star. And for what I've been told, it's been some hiccups. It's been some ups and downs as he gets to this place. But now he's like a legit Cup Series driver. He's that dude. He's been getting better. He's been improving. And he comes out for the race yesterday. And his fellow drivers pushed his car to the front. And there's this great picture, obviously, a selfie of him with his mask on. And he's showing he's showing himself. And he's showing all these people behind him. And they're all standing there in a measure of solidarity with him and it's been talked so much about what a powerful moving moment it was for him to stand there and have all the drivers and the crew and everybody behind him that's not what moved me it is not and I think it's cool that all those dudes decided that they would stand with him but if we're going to be honest here somebody left a noose in his garage area i'd hope they'd stand with him like i don't think i just i as much as we're like wow what a big shift this is for nascar there's a you know pull a knife three inches out my back sort of situation going on there when you talk about how moving this is and i admit it infuriates me when these things happen that everybody wants to jump on so much more for the heartwarming moment at the end than truly reckon with what happened in the beginning Right. Like this is a thing that just goes on. Right. You might not see a headline for the actual event, but the apology or everything else that comes on. So Richard Petty says he's going to put his arms around Bubba Wallace and that becomes the lead story. Right. Saying Richard Petty that said to people who kneel during the national anthem need to go find another country to live in. Right. And I, and this is the thing about it. I can't tell you so much what is inside of Richard Petty's heart. I can't do that. I don't like to get into that game. But I tell you this, he sounds like when he says that a whole lot of people who have made their hearts very clear to me can't just divorce ourselves from that because we got a happy moment because he came and hugged Bubba Wallace. We can't, we can't do that. That's just, that's, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to tell you what the moving moment was to me. The moving moment was after the race. When he's doing the interview and he's standing there and he takes off his mask and he says, I know I'm supposed to be wearing a mask right now, but I want these people to see you're not going to make me stop smiling. Right. And all of that. And I think that people really dug that part. That wasn't the part that moved me. And good for him, by the way, that he can stand in the face of this and maintain his temerity, maintain his constitution. Good for him. The part that was moving for me was those black people who were at the track behind him, behind that fence, as he stood there, 
with the Black Lives Matter t-shirts on and seeing him cry in that moment about that. And this is the reason why that part was what was moving for me. And this is where it's informed by my experience and it's informed by having him on the show. So when we had him on the pod, I didn't really want to talk to him about being the black NASCAR driver, right? Because I feel like a couple things. One, I feel like everybody has probably tried to hit him up to talk to him about that. Two, I think he legitimately does not want to be viewed in that context, right? And that's a bit of an assumption that I'm making on my end. But I'll always remember something he said. He said, look, man, I'm black. I might not be as black as some people, but I'm black. You know, you're just going to have to deal with this. And I should have asked the follow up when he said, maybe I'm not as black as some people. I don't know if he meant that from the standpoint of being light skinned, if he meant that from viewing it that way because his father is white. You know what I mean? Like I didn't I don't I don't know where exactly he came from on that. And for one, I admit, I don't always know what to say with what they call them biracial people. And the reason I always say biracial like that is you're black. Right. This idea that you get to decide, well, I'm kind of black and white at the same time. It's not how the game works. None of us decided we were going to be black. This is just what it is. You're black. Right. Your daddy is white. You are black. Like, that's how I see that. But I feel like at times when I do that, I could understand why somebody feels as though I am invalidating a person's experience. However, I'm not invalidating your experience as much as them's the rules. You know, cops don't care if your mama white. Right. Oh, we only going to beat you half as much. It's not how it works, right? You're black. But what I heard when he said that and what seemed to be pretty clear is that we're dealing with a dude who has been in this world of racing, right? He's leaving school every day to go to the track. He is many days, I would imagine, the only black person who is there and he's really, really good, right? And so that always, that becomes its own tricky sort of thing. And what I imagine is this dude's just trying to, He's just trying to kick it, you know? He's just trying to hang out like everybody as kids typically want to hang out. And the impediment to him just hanging out like everybody else gets to hang out is the fact that he's black, you know? This isn't a dude that's really looked to draw attention to his blackness because he doesn't have to draw attention to it. They all know it the second that he shows up. And it sounded in talking to him that that's created a lot of like awkwardness for him. And I imagine for him trying to figure out where exactly he belongs because he belongs in a race car. But does he belong at the track? And I think it can be difficult for those guys in those places with white people, but also for him hanging out with black people, right? Like, look, man, this kid told us he plays drums in a metal band. All right. Like, I don't I don't get the feeling that that means he's just hanging out with all these black people on his own time. If that's what he's if that's where the drum playing got him. Right. Like, I just don't feel like that's really the folks that he's been hanging out with. And I imagine that for him, he probably has a certain I don't know if insecurity is the way to put it, but wondering if he is accepted by black people because so much of his life is antithetical to what we associate with being black, you know. And so. Again, these are, this is a certain measure of conjecture that I'm offering, right? Like, I know that feeling somewhat, not entirely. Like, I look, I grew up in suburban Houston and on my block, we were the only black people who lived there. But like, I went to school. My parents intentionally had me go to school someplace that had more black people. I was around, you know, black colleges all the time. Like, I had an immersion in blackness that was there. But also, like, when I'm in school, I'm taking all the smart people classes. They're not putting a lot of us in the smart people classes. It's just me, right? And so when I'm not in the smart people classes and we go to the classes that are a little bit more of integrated in those ways, I'm probably for a long time a little more inclined to hang out with the white dudes because the white dudes are the ones that I've been taking classes with for all these years, right? Like these are the people that I know. Like I play ball and stuff and I'd be cool with cats and nobody ever ostracized me in any sort of way. But I was aware in many ways that I was not in the same place as them. But I always remember that my junior year, something happened and they couldn't put me in the smart people classes that I wanted for some reason. So they had to put me in some regular people classes and I was there. And it was really like for me the first time that I'd really had an opportunity in school to just be like hanging out with the black folks that were there. Like, I, you know, I hang out with them on a school bus and stuff like that or whatever. But this was different, right? 
And for me, it did a lot for my level of comfort because one thing I realized is any judgments that I thought that some of them might have about me, they did not have. You know, because you also got to remember this too. I didn't grow up where I went to school. So I wasn't like hanging out with these cats too much after school and stuff like that. Like I just felt like I was on this island. That's how I feel like Wallace probably feels. I'm leaving school and going straight to the track, right? You know, like I'm just on this island. I'm not with them in that way. And I remember that year I was just there and it wasn't no major thing. It wasn't no like shocking thing to change my life, but there was something for me to be said to be in this place and at an age, especially where you're looking for acceptance. And I'd always just been like the smart dude, right? That was the only thing I knew. And that was the first time I just got to be a dude that was there. And I was like, I look back on it and that was a really like important thing to me. You know, and then I go to an HBCU, which is if I had any of those reservations anymore, they were going to be completely out the window. But, you know, I never questioned my own blackness, but I did wonder sometimes how some other people might view me in the context of blackness. And so let's look at Wallace, who said, I'm not as black as some people. That says to me that that's somebody that on some level has questioned his own blackness, not judging him for this, right? Because I see he's growing up in a very particular circumstance. But that's what I hear is someone who has questioned his own blackness. And so I see this dude and he's standing there and he's got those people behind him and Black Lives Matters t-shirts, these fans that he had no idea that he had. Hell, Fans that had no idea they were his fans until he was out there. And what I saw was someone who perhaps this brought about a moment that I don't think he ever thought that he would fully experience. I think it's the moment that he realized that while he has been hoping to be accepted in this world of racing and that he has hoped that at some point that these white folks would take him as he is and not think of him as the black guy that happens to be there. Little did he know that as is just about always the case, your people been right over there with their arms wide open, ready to take you in. Because no matter how this goes, man, and you can look around the world on this, as long as you don't sell us out, we got you. We know the struggle that you have. We know what it's like, even if we haven't done it exactly for you. We know what it's like for you to be the one guy in that room. We know what the things are that you must have overheard people saying about you. We know the things that people have probably said to your face. We know how that feels. We know the humiliation that you have probably received at some point when you believed that these white people that you were with cared about you and saw you as being one of them. And then you've heard the things that they've had to say. We know all those things. We know the danger that you were in on a fairly consistent basis, being the man you are in the world that you're in, right? We know and we knew that there was a chance that the day would come that somebody would put a noose in your garage area. We are the ones who always appreciated what the struggle is that you were going through. And we have always been there prepared and ready when you needed it to take you in or when you just wanted it to take you in. And I see that picture of him with those people behind him. And I see the emotion on his face. And I see a man who realized that Whatever his own personal relationship with blackness happens to be, blackness has a relationship with him. Blackness embraces him and his type of black, his brand of black, his particular experience. We embrace that. We here for you. You can be good at this racing. You could be the dude finishing last every week. We going to have you because we know that you need us. Those dudes out there on that track, some of them are there for you because they know that you need them. But a lot of them are there because they know that they need him. We don't need you. Like in that way, that's not what it is at all. But there you stood at a track that George Wallace put up there because NASCAR was willing to embrace the segregationists. And black folks, Even though people have been out here with these flags and everything else in the midst of a pandemic, I imagine some of those people never been in that track ever before, didn't even know the directions 
or how to get to that track. And they were there for that dude. And I can't imagine how much that warmed his heart. And I hope for him that it helps solidify whatever there may be about him and his self-image that he's been trying to make peace with. I hope for his own sake that that moment and that day solidified that for him. You can say that this is a great day for NASCAR. No, sir. That was a great day for Bubba Wallace. And it didn't have nothing to do with them drivers that were on the track with him. That was a great day for Bubba Wallace because I think that that was the day that Bubba Wallace realized, no, my man, you are just as black as everybody else that's out there. You are just as black as me. You are just as black as those people who came to cheer you on. And they're going to be here with you until you tell them to leave. Now, please don't tell them to leave. Like, just just, 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 just to let you know, Gabe, I don't want nobody to have to cancel this dude. Like, please don't. Please don't. Please don't tell us to leave. These are fans that wouldn't have been there. Yeah. Had the last couple of weeks hadn't unfolded with banning the Confederate flag. But I also think past that, I just don't think they didn't know who he was. How would they know? How would they know there was a black dude racing? And his name is Bubba Wallace. They ain't know, right? <laughs> they had no concept of this. Now I'm just ready for the next level of it, which is, all right, I don't have no evidence of this, right? I don't know. But I'm just saying this right now. I don't know who you might be that's out there. Uh, maybe you one of the, uh, the city girls, maybe you, uh, maybe one of them Chloe and Hallie's. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of somebody else that might work out well. I'm just saying, which one of y'all wants to be Sierra to his Russell Wilson? All you got to do is get your agent to call his agent and y'all can make it happen. I'm just saying, not now that you know we here, brother, I'm here to tell you the sisters are here too. They down. They win it. I seen what they've been tweeting about your partner. They think you got a little something going for you. Like, I don't know. Look, I don't know what it is that you into, right? But I do know this. You've been out here hanging with these white dudes for a very long time. And one thing I know about these white dudes is they talk about black women. Some of them want to holler, but they're afraid that the black woman going to shut them down. That's their fear. I seen it. I know what's up here. I'm here to tell you, Bubba. Nah, man. They down. They down. They here for it. Come on over. Look how, look what Sierra has done for Russell Wilson's life. Look how everything has changed for Russell Wilson, right? I mean, he won that Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But he wasn't no top five quarterback. Look at him out here now. He wasn't hosting the ESPYs. You ain't see that, did you? No, no, you ain't get no evidence. In fact, since people are on their journeys, can one of y'all introduce Bubba Wallace to Naomi Osaka? I think that could work. She gave you a th- look at that. That's a great idea, isn't it? I don't know, man. The travel schedules might be kind of difficult. It might. It might. Naomi Osaka, she's going all international on us. That's true. That's true. I mean, but at the same time, that boy, maybe he could try to drive a Formula One. All I'm saying is, over the weekend, Naomi Osaka was sitting by the pool reading The Wretched of the Earth. Like, she put the wretched of the earth on the internet. It, 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 apparently now the wretched of the earth is real if you know you know type situation. There was a time where if you had bought a copy of the wretched of the earth, they was going to put your, they was going to put that in your file. Right? She got on the internet and put the wretched of the earth out there. She might need to meet Bubba Wallace too. Let's get this. How can we make this happen? How can we hook the two of them up? How can we put the two of them together? Right? Sloan Stevens, she already with that, with the Josie Altador dude, right? We can't, we can't bring her into the party right here. Let's do that. How do we bring Bubba Wallace and Naomi Osaka together? How can you? She ain't quite like Sierra, so it ain't going to be the same. But I think we can still find him a Sierra-like figure. The Miami Open. Ah, ah. I think the Miami Open is supposed to be the precursor to the U.S. Open or like right after Mm -hmm. it. And I don't know if the U.S. Open is really going to even be happening. Yeah. No, let let me think. I'm trying to think, though, like who who else or how else we can like kind of make this happen for Bubba Wallace. Like, I don't know too much, like, who the people are in his age range these days. That's like really the ones for him to come holla at. But y'all think, y'all think of some, 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 some nice young ladies that this dude could holla at. I really think that I can't tell. I, I don't know which one Chloe, which one Halle, but I feel like they'd be great for him. Then it could be Beyonce. Beyonce changes life. Beyonce have him out there hanging out with Solange. Solange talking that revolution type stuff to him. They think, you know, Bubba Wallace is going to be in the red, black and green 43 car. It can happen. It can happen. Why? Because we love you, Bubba, whether they treating you bad or not. 
Yeah, now you got me checking, just double checking to make sure that he is indeed single. Outright. Bubba Wallace's girlfriend makes statement after a news. Gay, 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 gay. Russell Wilson was once married. I'm just saying. I think it's a white lady too. I am not surprised. Just saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. No surprise there. No surprise there. I, 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 I absolutely 100% might have seen that coming. And that is why I'm saying, let's get him one of them city girls. They changed his life. Totally changed his life. City girl gonna be out here bumping Metallica, try to ride that lightning. You know what I'm saying? The next thing you know, Bubba Wallace gonna be out here talking about, oh yeah, I like that song. My neck, my back. It'll change his whole thing. Oh my God. Didn't see that coming, did you? That was fantastic. <laughs> but it has to be like some type of Sierra type figure that's gonna like open his mind. Yes. And also, too, has like maybe a little bit more notoriety than he yeah. to get him into the type of parties we need to get yeah. Bubba yes. Wallace into. Yeah, change, change his gear up. You see Russell Wilson yeah. started wearing them jackets with all the zippers and stuff like that. Yeah. But then, then there's the other part. Gabe, you ever seen the video for Sierra song called Ride? Whew. I'm sure I have, but I have not in a very long time. All I'm saying is I bet she changed Russell Wilson's life. <laughs> Period. Your man, Dak Prescott, signed that franchise tender, gave $31 million. He went ahead and signed it. I saw something on Pro Football Talk where Florio was like, yeah, well, he probably did it. Because, you know, maybe they were afraid the Cowboys might yank the franchise tag back, uh, similar to what the Panthers did with Josh Norman a few years ago. I don't think the Cowboys were ultimately going to do that. However, I can relate to Dak deciding to sign that franchise tender if he so decided. And the reason is very simple. I don't know how many of you guys have had to conduct any business during the pandemic. I have had to conduct business during the pandemic. And let me tell you what happens when you conduct business during the pandemic. Conducting business during the pandemic, it makes you take the money that's available right there. Right there. It make you real nervous. Ain't no telling. If it's money now, it don't mean it's going to be money later. Not everybody is ready for that sort of thing to come around. So in the midst of the pandemic, Dak, like, yo, where is the pen? Somebody offer you $30 million in the middle of the pandemic. Damn it, you better take it. Right? Like, that's where I feel Dak was right then and there. Somebody, please give me a pen. Go ahead and sign it. Now, this to me, though, like with quarterback, it's a little different than the position players. Because the thing about the quarterback is nobody can hit them whenever they actually get back. So none of us believe that Prescott was going to miss any gains behind this. And if they don't sign a long-term contract by July 15th, then they can't sign one anyway. So there's no realistic option in place for him to hold out. So he might as well go ahead and sign the tender because whenever he comes in, nobody's really going to do anything for him. I I just feel like in the last few months, ain't nothing gone the way Dak thought it was going to, right? Like Dak going for his money to get his money. I don't blame him for trying to get his money, but I think Dak, at least at this moment, is learning a difficult lesson. And I've been down this road before too. Dak was probably thinking, they got to pay me. Right? I did this, I did that. They got to pay. Nah, they don't. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't got to do nothing, actually. They don't, they don't got to pay you. That's that's not how it works. They don't got to pay you. And so he's been engaged in this fight. Over this money, fighting, 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 fighting for it, right? He rolled for Jerry in 2017 when Jerry was on his thing about the anthem, right? He did that. Just a couple weeks ago, Dak decided he wanted to do something because of the current times. The fool gave him a million dollars to the damn police. And maybe that's why he signed that franchise tender so fast. That man ain't got that much money. He signed that damn franchise tender. He's like, yo, man, I got to give up. The police want their million dollars. I don't want them showing up my house trying to get it. Right. And so we got that. So that gave the police a million dollars the day before Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson were uh, coming straight from the underground. Young brother got it bad because of Brown. Like, nah, Dak, you played that one wrong. That wasn't, that wasn't the way for you to do this. That wasn't it at all. Now he's trying to get his money, but he's in the middle of a pandemic. Up, up, up. Bad timing. Not the way you want to do it. Not the way you want it to go. No siree, Bob. All of these things. That's where he says. And now he's coming in for a season that might not happen. And he's got his franchise tag. You know what, Gabe? Maybe we need to find him a Sierra. What you think? She could change his life. Yeah. I'll say that much. (laughs) I tell you this. He get him a Sierra. He won't be giving no million dollars to the police. I actually thought about this. uh, Now now that we're talking about Bubba Wallace and maybe changing his life and everything like this. You know what I find to be funny? 
every time somebody wants to talk about this interracial affection, right? Everybody coming together. You know, they've been using the Drew, the Drew Brees dap picture. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Bubba Wallace got the Black Lives Matter car with the interlocking interracial dap. He's got there going. How come it ain't never a picture of a black man and a white woman holding hands? Huh? How come y'all ain't never got that? You know what I'm saying? How come that can't be our picture? That's all I'm saying. How come that can't be our picture of unity? Huh? 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 Imagine that. Bubba Wallace messing around and win a couple races, start feeling himself. The next thing you know, he come out there with a picture of him and his girlfriend on the front of the car. How you think that go? Given his girlfriend, there's an echo of the Bachelor conversation that you yes, had it last is. week. Yes, it is. And whether or not these NASCAR drivers would be able to handle that. Everything would go out the window. Everything would go out the window. Look, man, imagine Bubba Wallace with a race. He on the, the podium, right? They shoot the champagne off and everything else. He doing it. He got his queen up there with him. That's what you call her, your queen, right? He got his queen up there with him. And what if he showed that he what true love really is, right? Because let me tell you what true love do. And y'all know this. This is the real. True love, grab a booty in public. Like if it's true love and you at the movies and you waiting in line to get your tickets back when we did those things, true love, grab your woman booty in front of people. And she don't care because it's you. It's all good. That's how true love gets down, right? Like, I think I remember that first time I had like a real girlfriend or whatever. We in line somewhere and I tried to like sneak and grab a booty while we was up there. She's like, nah, you do that. We right here, right? That's what true love do. What a Bubba Wallace before was in true love on stage after winning some NASCAR. Yeah. Yeah. How would that go? How would that one go over? See, that's the thing, man. It's funny. People say that I turned everything into something about race. It's not that I turned everything into something about race. It's that I'm better at talking about this stuff because I'm the only one that's not afraid of talking about standing on stage at a NASCAR race with your Nordic queen grabbing her booty. And why can't you grab her booty? What's so salacious about this idea? What's so controversial about what it is that I am proposing? Nothing at all. When I talk about Russell Wilson and he ain't no longer kicking it with his ex-wife and he died with Sierra, everybody's weird. I see what you're talking about. I see what you're talking about. I want to say something about Bubba Wallace grabbing his queen's booty, right? Nah, hey, don't nobody know what to do now. Don't nobody know what to say. I'm just telling you, go all the way, baby. Go all the way with it. I didn't see that coming either, but here we are. I love that you wanted to do Dak Prescott as a topic. Purely so you can make your point about grabbing the bag in the pandemic, which lasted probably 45 seconds. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's all I had. Look, man, it was hard coming up with other topics. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Well, we still got a lot uh, going on with the colleges, uh, the college athletes. First of all, Gabe, do you think it's going to be a college football season? Because I don't think it's going to be no college football season. I don't think so. I mean, when you see all these reports of different schools having different numbers of players, pretty high, I'd say. Yes. As like a ratio per team. Testing positive? Mm -mm. Yo, because college students can't be trusted. They're irresponsible. Think about this. Your man, uh, Novak Djokovic, had his little tournament. Keep in mind that Djokovic has been talking about, y'all can't make me take no vaccine if I don't want to, all this stuff or whatever. And so they put together a little tournament, and a bunch of guys who were playing in the tournament apparently went out to a nightclub, and like five of them caught it, including Djokovic. Like a bunch of these dudes went out there and caught it. Now, the idea that in these times these dudes were going to a nightclub is really, really stupid. I think there's no way around that. Like, the fact that they put themselves in that position is stupid. I'm not blaming them, per se, for catching it, but I'm saying that they took unnecessary risk. And those are adults. Like, those are real-life grown-ups with real money on the line. And they did that. And we supposed to trust these college students to behave themselves and do what it is that they are supposed to do? No, nah, so they're turning up in droves with this. And in some cases, like, I think it was Clemson. Clemson got 20-something players that have it, but they showed up without it. You see what I mean? Like, like this whole thing just feels terribly unwieldy and impossible. And it feels like the colleges are basically saying, look, somebody's going to have to die in order to make this happen. Right. Or, 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 or make it stop. I don't know. What, you understand what I'm saying? Like, and I don't even know what die is the way to put it, but this doesn't feel safe. It doesn't. And the most disturbing thing about it to me 
is the idea that so many of these guys showed up for voluntary workouts. Now, I imagine that some of them just want to get out of their mama's house or wherever it is they've been. They miss their friends and everything else. But I am, again, stunned that there are so many people who are going, and I ain't heard not once about nobody's mama being like, my baby is not showing up here. We saw Trevor Ariza just said that he's not going to go to the NBA bubble because he's going to stay and take care of his son in the course of this time. So these are people that are walking away from millions of dollars. Like in Ariza's case, it's going to cost them, like I want to say something like seven figures to not do this, right? And none of these college players are doing that. And that, I think, speaks to what the power dynamic is. They worried about losing their jobs. They were, you know, losing their place on the depth chart and everything else. They worried about how it's going to look to the coaches and everything else. And so they're all showing up. And now these guys are catching it. And I can't imagine how terrifying it is for those people to, to be surrounded by people who are catching it. Dude, did you see that players at Ohio State were asked to sign a waiver? Yep. But this is a big story across the college landscape. Like people really jumped off on Ohio State about this. But the big thing that colleges have been trying to figure out in this is what is the liability that they're going to incur? Like it is possible that like a COVID situation could bankrupt not just a big school, I mean a small school, but a big school. Like this thing could be huge. So there's going to be a lot of waivers and stuff like that that are going to come around here because this is wildly unsafe. Right. Like everybody's taking a risk because they feel like they have to take a risk to get the money. But the risk is at the expense of the players. So let's fast forward to what's going on at UCLA, where apparently the players are saying we want an independent doctor in place for all of this that's going on because they don't trust the athletic department and their doctors. And it's been put particularly on Chip Kelly. Now, the part of this that I think is unfair to Chip Kelly is I think every player at every school should be requesting this. Every single one, right? Like every player is in the same situation as the kids are in at UCLA. And they feel like they've been rushed. You know, they feel like with the way other injuries and things have been handled, that maybe they've been rushed back and stuff like that. And all of this is kind of interesting to me because Chip Kelly's the guy that's supposed to be at like at the forefront of sports science. Yeah, they spend a ton of money on that stuff. Yes. Ah, I forgot. UCLA alum. Yeah. Yeah, I had to get that in the show, didn't I? <laughs> I had forgotten I had heard that in you. But that's supposed to be Chip Kelly's thing. So it was surprising to me. To hear that, and now we're starting to hear the other whispers about Chip that really tie back to what we were hearing like 2014, 2015 about the way that Chip relates to black players. And what I've always said as that relates to Chip is, I don't get too caught up in who is or isn't a racist, right? But I will note that Chip Kelly once had John Carlos come talk to his football team. (laughs) All right, like that's not typically the behavior of the quote unquote racist. I believe I talked to Harry Edwards about this. Harry Edwards seemed to be okay with Chip on these matters. But what I was told from people I talked to while that was going on then is that what Chip can't handle is if you got like a little bit of street in you, right? Like if something comes up that makes him think about your black, it gets a little weird for him. And I can believe that. That man spent 40 some years of his life just up there in New Hampshire. Like he had not had any real exposure to black people, I don't think, until he started as the offensive coordinator at Oregon in 2007. You know, like that's not, that's not, it's a lot for him. Like coaching major college football is actually not in line with what his life's work has been. This is just where the money is and where the challenge is for him. And hell, the way he coaches, he'll be back in New Hampshire pretty damn soon. He don't seem to be so good at this stuff anymore. But that's where he is with these players. And that's the latest of players being like, yo, man, we got demands. We got things we want. And they flexing it. Have we heard anything back from what's going on at Texas? Did we ever talk about that? And the boys at Texas went out there and said, look, we don't want you to sing the eyes of Texas anymore. The song's racist. And by the way, that thing where people are like, oh, my God, really? The eyes of Texas? Little do you know that black students at Texas have been telling each other for decades, don't ever get caught singing that song, by the way, just so you know. So we had that at Texas. We saw what happened with Shuba Hubbard at uh, Oklahoma State and those other guys. And I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. We saw what happened for like five minutes at Iowa. Before they got them boys to calm down after all was said and done there. And now we got a young man in Mississippi State. I believe his name is, I don't know how to pronounce this, if it's Keelan or Kylan. I really don't know. K-Y-L-I-N Hill. And he retweeted the governor of Mississippi and said that either change the flag or I won't be representing this state anymore. I mean that. I'm tired. Yeah. Yo, man, a lot of these dudes, for whatever reason, have simply had enough. And maybe they're empowered by the protests. Maybe they are, I don't know if empowered by COVID-19, but that's just creating a different level of tension and anxiety for a lot of people. But they're not going for it, man. 
And I think that in a lot of ways, the schools are still going to be able to like get together and be like, yo, let's have a talk. Right. And then they go have a talk and then we call them a bunch of stuff down. Everybody's like, oh, my bad, you know, so forth and so on and all of those things. But I am really struck by how many players in this day and time have the courage to stand up to these coaches who have been bullying them for decades. And I don't even get the feeling like with this dude Hill at Mississippi State, like he's a good player. But this doesn't feel like entitlement or diva type behavior or impulsive stuff or anything else. He's just like, yo, I'm not going to do this. Simple as that. I am not going to do this. And those are the people in this I really do applaud in a lot of ways who just make these individual decisions. Like the WNBA, I don't do enough to talk about the work that those women in that league do in terms of social stuff. But what I love about it, Maya Moore, just waking up and being like, hey, I ain't playing this year. I got something better to do. And I'm going to dedicate myself to that. People just being like, nah, man, I just can't do this right now. So like we talk about Kyrie and Dwight Howard where they're like, yo, I think a lot is going on outside. I'll do whatever the larger group does, but I think dot, dot, dot. Nah, man, if you bought it, you're going to make this happen yourself, right? And the people that are willing to stand alone, like I was talking uh, in a group text with a couple people, um, and we were talking about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and how Kareem doesn't get enough credit. Kareem boycotted the 68 Olympics all by himself. He himself was like, nah, I'm not going to go. Nah, don't feel right. I'm not doing it by himself. Like that takes heart. That takes a whole nother level of your situation to make these decisions all by yourself that you're not going to do it. And we're starting to see those people pop up. And those are the ones who ultimately inspire. Those are the ones who make people look at themselves and be like, okay, why can't I do this? And that's how you get it more likely that you get a group of people in the room because it's more of these individual things. That energy is contagious and people just look around and be like, yo, why we got to do this? Like the Mississippi thing with the flag is interesting because this is what I think is happening with it. I thought at least the governor of Mississippi seems to be given a different impression. But my thing with what's going on in Mississippi is there wasn't really a push for taking that flag down. I'd seen discussion, but I had not really seen a push. And the next thing I know, the Southeastern Conference says we're not going to give you guys championships, even though they hadn't given them a championship and God knows how long in the state of Mississippi. And so they say we're not going to hold championships there. And then we get a statement from uh, the president of Mississippi State. I think we got a statement from the president of Ole Miss. And then the governor says, over the last several years, I have repeatedly warned my fellow Mississippians that any attempt to change the current Mississippi flag by a few politicians in the Capitol would be met with much contempt. If the leadership in 2001 had not put it on the ballot, then the conversation, conversation may be different. But they did. And therefore, we, we must work together to find a solution where it, when everyone has their say, we could come back together as a family and prosper. We must work together to find a solution. Once all is said and done, unites us as a people proud of our future. I have been thinking and praying hard about the best way to accomplish that. Over the weekend, there's been a proposal floating among some of the legislature to create a second Mississippi flag. Let's call it the separate but equal option. Well, intention, I'm sure, it does not meet the threshold. Any similar plan would accomplish the exact opposite of our stated goal. It would actually divide our state more. I don't believe it would satisfy either side of this debate, and I don't think it is a viable alternative. Now, I had no idea that people were actually talking about, like, trying to come up with a second flag, like schools have second proms, right? I had no clue that that is what people were talking about. However, the governor gets that this is a bad look. Right. The governor understands that this is probably something that they cannot sustain. The governor also understands that he is in such a fiercely segregated state. And, and I need to explain this to you to understand the level of segregation in Mississippi. And it stands out more in Mississippi than other southern states, but it still stands out in southern states. Nonetheless, do you realize how segregated this whole thing has to be if that state is 36 percent black and every statewide office is Republican? My black people vote over 90 percent Democrat, right? 36 percent of the state is black. 90 percent of that 36 is voting for the Democrats and the Democrats can't win nothing. The races aren't even close. That's because all the white people are voting for Republicans in a way that is not the case in the rest of the country. They all are like that's the level of divide that they've got there. And so I think the governor knows this flag has to go, but also knows that if you lead us to a popular vote, white folks ain't going to do it. Right. The need to demonstrate to black people that white people are in charge of Mississippi has been going on basically prior to Reconstruction, but especially since Reconstruction, because there were so many black people in Mississippi. It was majority black for so long. The only way white people could maintain control was through these means. That was the only way they could do it through terrorism, through all of these things, because otherwise 
it was just too many black people. If they played it fair and square, Mississippi would have had black leadership for over a century. If they played it fair and square, South Carolina would have had black leadership for over a century. You, you get where I'm coming from here, right? And so white people have always in Mississippi been galvanized voting for whiteness because that was the only way that whiteness could maintain power in that state. So this Confederate emblem that's in the corner of their flag is a sign of that power, right? It's the 21st century when they decided to keep it, okay? So that's a sign of that power. That governor knows that if they put that on the ballot, it'll never come down. They know that. Like think of all the tricks that Ole Miss had to go through to finally get the Confederate flag out of the stadium and the way they finally got it done was not by banning the flag, but by saying you couldn't bring the flag if it was on a stick because the stick was a safety hazard. That's how they got it done. That was how they were able to make it happen, was by banning the sticks. Because them folks are so dedicated over there to giving this impression of white people being in charge. All right? That's where we are. So I think the governor is looking at the schools in the SEC and like, look, man, I can't do this myself. And I can't get this passed on no ballot. But if y'all start squeezing us, right? And y'all start acting like this is going to mess up the football. Then maybe I got a chance over here to get this done. But I need you to do this. Because I can't. And they can't. Because if it looks like you're bowing down to black people, the white folks are going for them like Voltron. And shut you down. But if it looks like the SEC wants this. Now people might start to listen. That's what I think is going on there. I could be wrong. I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. For what is happening there. And so I look at that young man. where He's like well I ain't going to come. I'm almost like oh oh, hey man. You might kind of sort of be messing up the program. Not that you shouldn't stand on what you believe. Right. But they'll do it if a white man say to do it. If a Southern white man say to do it, they got a chance. Black people tell them to last 150 years indicate that'll make them fight. We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you now. If you haven't heard. All right, but money, this first story comes from public safety. Hi, this is Jeffrey Drick. I'm an editor at Slate magazine. I live in Boston, where everybody in my neighborhood is convinced that there are way more backyard fireworks being shot off than usual this year. I decided to look into this for a piece, and what I discovered is that there has been a big spike in fireworks complaints in Boston, New York, and a number of other cities across the country. In Boston, for example, there was a 2,300% year-over-year increase in complaints for the month of May. Now, this is the time of the year in the lead-up to July 4th that there are generally more fireworks being shot off, and thus more people complaining about them. And over the last two decades, there's been a successful nationwide effort to liberalize state fireworks laws, with the result that Americans are generally consuming a lot more fireworks than they used to. So those factors could make it a little tricky to parse out how extraordinary 2020 is in terms of fireworks use. Maybe it's just more people complaining. But then I spoke to the fireworks industry, and I learned that there has been a significant nationwide increase in consumer fireworks sales this year. Especially in the week since I wrote my piece, there are a lot of theories floating around the internet and social media about what could lie behind that increase. The first is what I'll call the boredom hypothesis. The fireworks industry and government authorities both agree that the pandemic is a big part of this story. There are more people sitting around at home with nowhere to go, other entertainment options closed, so why not explode some stuff? There's also a supply and demand theory. The display side of the fireworks industry, this is the companies that put on the professional shows, has been devastated by the widespread shutdown of events. Some of those companies also operate consumer side businesses or retail locations. The law prohibits retailers from selling pro-grade stuff to the public, but there may be some opportunities to reallocate inventory or staff resources to where the demand is. That could result in more fireworks sales to the public. A last theory is that the consumer fireworks industry has adopted some new marketing strategies because of the pandemic. For example, most fireworks sales happen in the days leading up to July 4th, resulting in long lines at stores. One retailer I spoke to worried that they wouldn't be able to accommodate as many last-minute shoppers this year because they are limiting how many people can be in their stores at once. So they are doing more early bird discounts and promotions to try to get people buying sooner. And most of the major retailers 
have now started offering online shopping and curbside pickup. Online sales were a practice that was almost non-existent before the pandemic in this industry. These practices could be helping the fireworks companies reach new customers. I live in New York City where people like what I've seen people be out here like, hey, you know, maybe it's not more fireworks. You just know it's all the time fireworks They're all over the place. And it's not like it's not like people just in the street shooting off firecrackers, you know, like you're looking up in the sky. Like I hadn't really paid that much attention to it. But on Juneteenth, I was looking at it and I was like, oh, wow. I'm a little surprised that the Bronx is going up for Juneteenth like this, right? This, this is a different group of people, one would think. And then you start seeing it, and it's not, again, it's not just like boom, boom, boom going off. It's big displays. Like, you see them up in the air. Like, it would be really cool if it wasn't happening every single night. And that's led to some people to raise the question as to whether or not this is, like, something being perpetrated by the government of some sort to get people used to all the noise and everything else. I don't know if that's true, but I will tell you what I noticed last night. A block not too far from my house that I could see from the roof, I could look and I could see like the pretty fireworks. And then I saw one block and it just looked like a bunch of flashbangs, right? It was just boom, 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 boom. And I saw like light coming, but it wasn't fireworks. Like there was no pageantry to it or anything like that. So I don't know what exactly is going on, but it's hard for a lot of us to believe that in this time where ain't nobody really got no money that people are putting bread on fireworks right now, no matter how cheap they happen to be. Like they're asking for a lot out of people. And I'm very curious how long exactly this is going to go. Were you up on the roof last night snapping a selfie of your hair reveal? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> I, I was on the roof in the afternoon taking pictures of my hair reveal. And at night I was just looking at the city. Thank you. Can I enjoy the skyline? Huh? Huh? That's what I was doing. I don't understand what's so funny. People love this. All right. The second story comes from entertainment. Hi, this is Kim Lyons with The Verge. So movie theater chain AMC, which is the biggest movie theater chain in the world, is getting ready to reopen theaters across the country next month. At first, the company CEO said AMC wasn't going to require customers to wear masks at its theaters because it didn't want to be drawn into a political controversy. Well, that decision was met with almost immediate pushback, and AMC has now reversed its policy and says it will require masks for all customers at its theaters. Several other movie theater chains have followed suit and also will require masks. There are several big movies set to debut next month, including the new Mulan, including Christopher Nolan's Tenet. So there's a lot of anticipation and a lot of buzz. And movie theaters have been closed since March, so they're pretty desperate for some revenue. If you're planning to go to the movies when theaters reopen, make sure you have a mask. If you don't bring one, most theaters will provide one for you. AMC has mentioned that its revenue is in such tough shape that if it's not able to reopen theaters next month, it may not bode well for its future. Yeah, this dude is an idiot, right? Like the idea, he's like, I don't want to be drawn into something political. Do you want to be drawn into headlines of all the people catching it at your movie theaters? Like, seriously, are you kidding me? Like opening the movie theaters at all doesn't seem like a very good idea. I don't want to get caught in anything political. You just did it right then and there, right? Like, no, no. Put your mask on. I saw something, and I need to verify this, but I'm going to throw it out here anyway. I saw something that said these two barbers had caught it. I forget what city it was in, but it's two barbers who had caught it. Between the two of them, they had 140 clients. The barbers wore masks. The clients did not. Of those 140 clients, none of them caught it. None of them. Like, the mask is such an effective thing. Why is it so hard for y'all to just put a mask on? I just don't see what is so difficult about this for you just put something over your face we could get so far in this because part of what's happening here is all these look all these leagues and everything else they're trying to come back right now they had been told basically that if everybody did what they were supposed to do and if we were on track then june or july we would be able to start getting back to action that's what people were told and now we're seeing people now that it's june or july getting back to action except for the fact that we ain't been acting right if y'all just act right Everything will take care of itself, but you got to act right. And this fool will not do a little small part to get people to act right because I don't want to be caught up in politics. All right, buddy, let me tell you what will happen to you. This thing will all calm down except ain't nobody wearing no mask and we're going to stop calling it COVID-19 and we're going to start calling it AMC disease. You're going to be like the new Legionnaires. 
out here doing this. What are you, crazy? It's not like they're offering discounted tickets or something like that. This right. isn't like you're getting compensated like hazard pay or something for putting yourself at risk. I think their dilemma is that the studios have figured out that they can monetize this via homes. And so they're shook. And so on one hand, I'm like, put the mask on so you can keep the place open. On the other hand, they're worried about telling people they have to wear a mask and people staying home. And then never coming back because they realize that they can just watch the movie in the comfort yeah. of their own home. And also the jackasses that'll be like, I ain't going nowhere that's going to make me wear a mask, right? Like maybe they're worried about them. So like maybe there's like an additional room for this. But in the end, Put your mask on, man, whether that man tell you to or not. Going to the movies isn't that wonderful of an experience anyways. People kicking on the back of your seat, talking right. during the movie. Yeah, uh, You don't like people very much. Man. Yeah, I'm skeptical. <laughs> this last story comes from science. This is Greg Allen with NPR News. I'm based in Miami for NPR. I've been recently reporting on a plan by the Army Corps of Engineers. They've been developing a plan to protect Miami from storm surge. You know, that's the part of a hurricane that typically causes the most damage, you know, the most loss of life. In 1992, for example, a 17-foot storm surge in Hurricane Andrew did some $500 million in damages to an area just south of Miami. So this is a huge project the Army Corps of Engineers is looking at. It would cost some $4.6 billion. If it goes forward, it could take a decade or more to complete. Right now, they're taking public comment on it. The Corps is proposing building a series of seawalls along the Miami waterfront. Some of these walls could be as high as 15 feet in some places, maybe cause some issues with how well you can see the water. The plan calls for pumps and storm surge gates placed on three waterways, including the Miami River, which is a working river here in Miami. The Corps has similar plans in the works for other places along the southeast and the east coast. Norfolk, Charleston are two cities where they have plans like that going forward. One major question surrounding the project here in Miami, though, is sea level rise. With climate change, Florida expects to see as much as a foot and a half in sea level rise over the next 60 years. This plan takes that into account, but doesn't do anything really to address the long-term flooding issues that this region may see in coming years. It could also have a big environmental impact on Biscayne Bay, a sensitive area. That's where coral reefs they are now already being stressed a lot by all the traffic from marine traffic and, and other things going on in the bay. So at this point, the plan is welcomed by local officials as something that could potentially help the city avoid billions of dollars in damages from a direct hit from something like Hurricane Katrina. But as I say, it's a long process. A much larger project to protect New York City from storm surge was put on hold earlier this year after President Trump tweeted his opposition to it. Hey, man, when I first moved to Miami, I read a story and the story said that basically Miami had 100 years left. Many years left because it's always bracing for the storm that's going to shut the whole thing down. I feel like looking around at everything that's happening in the world, but I mean, oh, oh, it ain't gonna happen now. It ain't gonna happen now. Everything feel like the end of the world now. You got to start preparing in a way that you did not before. Is that also not part of what makes it enticing to live in Miami now? Is that it may not be there in the future? Nah, that's not that. That that that, that was not a draw. <laughs> no. I will say that that was that was not, not part you. of the appeal, but. No, no, no. But the other thing with Miami is they have to do a significant amount of drainage just for it to be livable as it is. Like Miami is totally synthetic. Everything about it is synthetic, right? But that's the big thing. They pump a lot of water out to stop it from being swamps and to make it into effectively what it is. But no, 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 no. We are definitely running a game on Mother Nature. The whole existence of Miami is running a game on Mother Nature. Before I went to Miami for the first time, I had no idea that Miami Beach was basically like constructed out there on some sands yes. and would yes. be un would be underwater if not for yes. human intervention. Yes, it's not really like this. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. It's not really like this. Like I think the beach is like I think it's full on synthetic beach. People are going to be so mad when they start building up big concrete blocks to kind of protect them from a future storm surge and is blocking their view, like Greg said. Yes. Oh my God, people are going to be heated. Yes, like listen, I'm looking at uh, something on The Verge from 2016. So Miami Beach is out of sand. Now what? <laughs> That's the subhead. Miami Beach has run out of sand. Now what? The beach is every bit as artificial as the towers and turquoise pools. For years, the sea has been eating away at the shore. and The city has spent millions of dollars pumping sand from the seafloor to replace it, only to have it wash away again. Every handful of sand on Miami Beach was placed there by sand. Oh, my gosh. Hey. 
Hey, this is Bomani. You have reached the right time voicemail. Say whatever you want. Get creative with it. But this is your place to talk back to the show. So talk back. Peace. All right, Bomani. So for the social segment this week, for opening up the voicemail line to people, there was a big party that was supposed to happen, a big rally that was supposed to happen this past week. And let's just say the attendance wasn't quite what people thought it would be. Is that is that a fair characterization? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I still contend, just to be clear here. I don't care how many people they thought was coming, they said got tickets, whatever it was. Tulsa ain't close to nowhere. How like how 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 was a million people, a million people gonna get their way to Tulsa? From where? Where were they gonna fly into? Where were they gonna drive into? Where were they gonna sleep? All of these things. You could only fall for that if you just believed it. Like that's all I was talking to my brother about this. My brother's like, yeah, man, the TikTok kids, they uh they they convinced Trump that all these people were coming. I'm like, as if Trump did not believe already that a million people were coming. As if he doesn't think a million people are coming anytime he talks. They didn't get fooled. People just didn't come to the party. So we thought it would be funny to solicit voicemails from a time where you had a party or went to a party when it wasn't as advertised the number of people that were supposed to be there didn't show up any kind of stories tangentially related to that we had some pretty funny ones first comes from robert in trinidad and tobago and a group of partners were having a party they insist that all the lovely ladies will be there and everybody out of all three it will be real good they have the dj on point everything set good they asked me as a favor, because I was going to be running late, if I could bring 10 bags of ice when I'm coming. Now, as I told you, I'm doing the favor. Bo, I got a text message. It got uh, from 10 bags to 8. 15 minutes later, 8 bags to 5. Before I arrived, got a text message telling me, don't worry about the bags of the ice. So when I showed up at the party, if it wasn't for the two of the guys, mothers and fathers, then it would have had four people. <laughs> but the guy disappeared for two months. We couldn't find him. I just used to text him and ask him, just message us back to make sure you realize him. The guy took two months to recover from the shame. From the shame. You have four people show up? Having to put out for an order like that, isn't that always the funniest thing when it's you're trying to anticipate how big of a party it's going to be? And this goes for just about any party. This goes for like a wedding when you're trying to figure out how much food yes. you've got to buy, party, figuring out how much liquor you're going to buy, how much meat for the grill, whatever. And the overestimating and who gets left holding the bag, the person that's running the errand. <laughs> yep. Going to pick yep. up 10 bags of ice. Is he getting reimbursed for those 10 bags of ice? Yeah. I was like, somebody got, somebody still got to pay for this stuff. I tell you this though. I'll tell you something that actually changed my life is a moment like these. Are you familiar with a reggae artist named Yellow Man? Refresh me. Yellow Man, uh, you wouldn't know if I, like, if the name didn't jump out, you wouldn't know. But, uh, Yellow Man was big in the eighties and nineties. He got his big hit. I think it's called Murderer. You kill I today. You cannot kill I tomorrow. Murderer. Like that's yeah, it. Anyway. That. I went to go see Yellow Man and Raleigh, and Raleigh is notoriously for poorly promoting shows, right? So it's me, my man Petey Green does the beat on this track, my homeboy Che. So it's three of us, counting the three of us, five people showed up to the show at the Lincoln Theater. And when I tell you that man put on a full concert, he put on for the five of us like there were 5,000 people there. I will go see Yellow Man anytime somebody tells me that he's in town. It molded my approach to life and work after that. That if it's only five people there, then you get those five people to show. Because I don't know if I would have had that in me myself. And he's a legitimately legendary figure. Yeah. And he gave us a show. Damn. All right, this next one comes from Red in Brooklyn. We were supposed to show up at this party. They have been throwing out the flyers, promoting all over social media. Fam and them was going ham, saying everybody and their mom and them going to be there. Talking about NBA players is going to be there. So we wait. I pick out my outfit, pulled out the right Jordans and everything, shirt and everything. Boom, we pull up to Fam Crib in the middle of the project. 9.30 at night. It's brick. The wind is blowing. Yo, we get upstairs. We see... Homeboy, grandma, and them doing a Tootsie Roll. Another dude in the corner 
had the stole hanging off his lip, and you had three cousins trying to figure out who's the DJ. <laughs> Never been more disappointed in my life. That was the worst function we ever try to show off that. <laughs> and you know, the worst part about something like that is you always afraid that right after you leave, it's going to start cracking. You're one of those NBA players going to show up, huh? Yeah, yeah. Like You're going to be like, yo, man, this is whack. And then you leave, and then you come back the next day. Dog, man, I was looking for you. It was popping. Man, in using a flyer to advertise, you're selling everybody on a dream. Yes, yes. This is just our guy here. Like, what about all the women that went to the party thinking they were about to see NBA players? <laughs> yeah, let me tell you this. If all they call them is NBA players... Or my favorite is in a little small town. Like, uh, I went, I was trying to go to Louisville one time. I didn't make it for the Kentucky Derby because my homeboy lived there. And, uh, Der- you remember Derek Anderson? Uh, he was playing the NBA, he played in Kentucky. And he was apparently the man in Louisville at the time. My boy said you couldn't go anywhere on the radio. It was all, yo, Derek Anderson, come party with me and my celebrity friends. Celebrity friends is always the all purpose that they use under those circumstances, hoping that somebody winds up showing up. It ain't gonna happen. Come party yes, with me. Yes. Which yes. means the last 30 minutes of the party if you do show up. Yes, yes. That is, that is affirmative. I, man, it used to be this club we used to go to in college called the warehouse. Now the warehouse was interesting because on Friday nights it was the warehouse, but on Saturday nights it was tracks. And, uh, on Friday nights it was college night and I think they let ladies in free for a certain part. And on Saturday night they could let ladies in free all night and not lose a dime. If you understand where I'm coming from here. They attracted it was a different clientele on Saturday night than it was on Friday night. But the warehouse used to stay lying to us about who was going to be performing. Oh, yeah, we got cannabis and Missy Elliott at the spot tonight. And I remember once we went, like, we was like, yo, they ain't going to be there, but let's go. And we asked uh, some dude we knew who worked there. We were like, yo, so it's cannabis. And he just laughed in our faces and walked away. Especially when it's made up, the creativity behind that to think, okay, who's going to bring the biggest draw when it's clearly fake? Yes. All right. This last one comes from AC in Texas. So my homeboy Sweet wanted to throw a party. Sweet's his last name. Let me type. Let me paint you a picture of what the type of dude Sweet is. Light skin, tattoos. Be taking his shirt off in the club. Be thinking he Chris Brown. <laughs> so he wants to promote parties. Me and my other homies are like, okay, we're gonna get a section, get the bottles, the whole nine yards. We like it's lit. Okay, they fall through. But I already bought my pre-sale ticket, so I was looking for other other of my homies that were going to go through. So X and JP were going. So I hit up X and JP and, like, you're going to sweet party. They're like, yeah. So we rode a sweet party. We get there at, like, 11. It started at 9, but when you tell black people it starts at a certain time, you got to add two extra hours to the time that it starts. So we get there at 11. They got the red carpet taking pictures. I'm like, okay, it's going to be live in here. We get inside. There's 10 people inside. I'm like, what is going on? But I ain't really tripping. It's 11 o'clock. We go outside. They do what they do. We get back inside. It's like 11.30, 11.40. Still no one's in there. It's still like 10, 11 people. And I'm like, man, what is what is going on? I look at JP. I give him that look. Like, I ain't really ready to go, but if you go, I'll go. Because, like, when I spend money, if it's 20 at the door, you're going to have to see me the whole night. I ain't just giving you free money. <laughs> so 11.30, 11.40, it's 12.30. Sweet light, I, we got some free drink vouchers. Go get you a drink. So I'm like, okay, cool. We get the drinks. One o'clock, it was 15 people. He promoted this thing for two weeks, did a promo video, and 15 people showed up. So we was all just staring at each other. So I got home at 2 o'clock, woke up at 5. Showed up to Planet Fitness at 6 a.m. for my shift that Monday morning. I got to say, when he was like, let me describe Sweet for you, I was like, you didn't have to tell me anything after you said you was from Funky Town, Texas. I'm actually just glad that that worked out the way that it did and not in a hail o gunfire. A demo video. A demo video. Pre-sale tickets. I thought the, the best line of it was, if I'm paying 20 bucks to get in the door, you're going to have to see me the whole night. I'm staying all night. <laughs> I would be there all night, right? Like, never buy the idea of sunk costs, right? Never buy the idea that you ain't never getting that 20 back. Nah, 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 nah. He say he going to be there all night long. I respect the dedication. I truly do.
<laughs> but hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Thank you to our If You Haven't Heard contributors. Thank you to Jeff Friedrich of Slate. Check out his story on the fireworks that seem to be more plentiful than usual on Slate.com. Thanks to Kim Lyons of The Verge. Check out her story on AMC Theaters, now requiring people to wear masks at TheVerge.com. And thanks to Greg Allen of NPR. Check out his story about Miami spending $4.6 billion to storm-proof itself. Remember, subscribe to the right time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to think you are a hater. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.